Mira wasn't talking, but Jake knew his almost killing a man was the reason she was hesitant to accompany him to the beach for the weekend. Look, I panicked, he explained to her, lifting a hand from the steering wheel to reach behind his neck and awkwardly scratch his back. They were gliding through a red light at a crowded intersection. The dude was drowning, and I'd never dealt with a drowning before, okay? I didn't know what to do, so I bolted for my phone. Scott was proud I'd kept it in the break room instead of having it out on the deck, you know. It was maybe the third or fourth time Jake had told the story. Each time he gave a new defense, or at least a variation of his prior defenses. From the way Jake spoke about the incident, it would seem that Scott was happier about Jake following his cell phone policy than the drowning victim pulling through against all odds. I would not even have seen the guy had I had my phone out. You know all the younger guards are always on their phones. And if Scott was so proud, why did he fire you? Mira could not suppress the thought, even if she could suffer to contain it in her head. She gazed out the passenger window. They had arrived at the entrance to the children's place, her work since before she and Jake began dating. Supposedly, this job was funding the repayment of the debt incurred by her extended stay in art school. But that five-figure number, its stare always boring into her heart through her neighbor's laptop screen, never seemed to budge even as her paychecks slowly but surely wound their way into her loan servicer's pockets. You have a good day at work, okay, baby girl? She stepped out of the F-150 and without the smallest utterance calmly shut the door with eyes downcast. She heard the roar of Jake's engine when he sped away as she approached the entrance to the store. Black folks are always hard to pin down, said Jake's mother. She shrugged, popping a blue cheese crumble into her mouth. She might just be angry, Jake. They tend to get angry. Usually they'll show they're angry, though. Mom threw up her hands as her mouth worked at several more pops of blue cheese. Well, I did warn you it wouldn't be an easy relationship. She swallowed, leaned on the marble countertop. Your father and I stuck to our own kind and we still had problems. Not that I have any issue with you seeing this girl of yours, but I knew she'd probably pull something like this. I've been meaning to teach her how to swim. This weekend would have been perfect to get her some real experience. I thought you should, said she could swim. She's had problems with the deep end, can't do deep water. Doesn't shock me, Mom said. Those people hardly ever do well in shallow water, she added, smart elecky. Maybe you should start her on something smaller than the ocean. We've tried at the Y, but I'm not exactly allowed there anymore, Jake replied bitterly. This weekend was supposed to be fun, you know? She said she'd be up for it, but now she's acting like she doesn't want to go, like she doesn't trust me. Mom sighed. Well, she mused. I can't say I don't blame her. The pool at the Y only goes to five feet, and... And I still managed to completely blow saving someone, Mom, I know. At least the dude's alive, Mom smirked. I could pull some strings to get you a job lifeguarding on Salmon Road if you want to keep working this summer. Jake rolled his eyes. All I want this summer is to take her out on the water. Then show her the jet ski, Mom suggested immediately. She sauntered out of the kitchen and plopped herself onto the firm ebony seat of the living room couch. She pawed for the remote to the flat screen. It lay on the chest filled with Jake's video games, which sometimes doubled as a coffee table. I can't think of anyone who wouldn't love that. Put her in a life jacket. She'll feel perfectly safe. The jet ski, of course. Jake had forgotten all about it. Got a surprise for you, baby girl. I'll be off in ten minutes. Jake pulled Mira away from the cash register and led her to, the, to his truck. In the bed sat the family jet ski, ruby red and succulent in appearance as though it were a massive plump strawberry. Mira found herself in awe. Such a spectacle something could be when it was so out of place, so removed from where one would expect to find it. Mira couldn't help but think of the first summer of her relationship with Jake and how he'd made good on his promise to put his annual passes to Disney World to use. 
how enthralled she was by Cinderella's castle. It seems she was transported out of Florida altogether into a European wonderland teeming with culture. And now her prince had arrived with his magic carpet, it seemed. Mira chuckled. What is this, Jake? You trying to buy my love? Nah, girl, I just wanted to show you a fun time. Mira frowned. Jake had shown her many a fun time, she had to admit. Experiences she never dared to dream about. Privileges she didn't and never would have. Her thoughts slipped out of her control. She could see her mother, Mr. Donald, was cr climbing atop her, doing his business per his self-designed schedule. Tears streamed down Mama's cheeks, but her voice never rose above a whimper. Mr. Donald would come and go as he pleased. His hands were as wide as Dixie plates and had enough power to cast Mira aside whenever she was in the way. And because Mr. Donald liked his space and took up an inordinate amount of it, Mira found that she was in his way a lot. It was only when Mr. Donald's grip became too hard, too vice-like on Mira, that Mama ever protested. And oh, how she'd pay for it when she did. You alright, baby girl? Yes, Mira said softly, nodding. She pretended it was something else that was bothering her. Are, are you sure it's safe? She allowed Jake to lift her onto the bed of the truck to get a better view. The jet ski baked and glared under the heat of the July sun and was hot to the touch, but dazzling nonetheless. It's perfectly safe, Jake insisted, and we'll have life jackets on. This relaxed Mira. Bright orange ones, too. There's no way someone could miss us if we were stranded. Mira flinched at the idea of being adrift with nothing around but sea, but Jake didn't notice. He seemed to check a watch, but he wasn't wearing one. He was apparently examining his skin. And let's be real, you think anyone would miss me with how pale I am? Mira covered her mouth so she wouldn't see so he wouldn't see her laugh. Though she knew he wouldn't mind that she had. There could be no other couple besides her and Jake that were so contrasting, physically speaking. In body they were epically different. Biblically, epically, epically different. She black as Cain, he white as wool. She is Zacchaeus, he a Goliath. If Goliath were as skinny as the little king he fought, that is. I'll go, Mira said. She flashed Jake a smile, small and modest, but indisputably genuine. Then he, she bowed her head, as if remorseful. I'm sorry I've been so moody lately, babe. Of course I trust you. You know just how to treat a girl right. Jake was soaked. He shivered, but perhaps not because he was cold. He sat in Walter Abram's fishing boat, draped in a towel that seemed more like an oversized rag, unsure how to feel. It wasn't my fault, asserted Jake. His voice was weak, but nearing on hostile, nonetheless. Walter was letting him drink out of a gallon jug of water. Walter was a fat man with a deep, leathery tan. Perhaps he brought along the jug because fishing was his version of a workout at the gym. He wore tattered swim trunks poked with holes here and there, a loose-fitting red polo, and a blue visor with a Hawaiian flower pattern. Jake was easy for him to find in the rolling expanse of blue. He shone like a pearl, much to Walter's amusement. But Walter was also concerned, deeply, he could tell Jake had seen something men ought not see, something uncanny, otherworldly. But it was really something that dwells closer to people than they realize. Something in everyone's domain, even if it seems so separate. Something that is forgotten in the monotonous routine of work and unconcern of leisure. Something that shouldn't share our planet with us, as if this planet is ours alone. The jet ski was gone. No relic of it survived. I swear, I swear it wasn't my fault. Of course it wasn't, son, soothed Walter. O of course it wasn't. No one can predict something like that. Jake said nothing. Wal water dripped from his hanging, red as blood hair. Walter kneeled. Jake avoided eye contact. The stranger placed his hand gingerly on the young man's freckly bare shoulder. 
There's nothing you could have done for her son. There's no reason to feel guilty. Jake gulped. He nodded rapidly. Yeah, he agreed. His lips were dry, though he just downed the last of Walter's water. You're right. You're right. Mira felt indeed like Princess Jasmine as she hugged Jake's waist, puffy in her life jacket, screaming with joy as they whizzed across the ocean, white water thrown behind them like the wisps that remained from flown-through clouds. She didn't even notice that the beach had disappeared from their sight completely. Jake, unexpectedly and much to Mira's disappointment, brought the jet ski to a halt. So they were floating like a moat of dust in the air, gently rocked by the waves. Hey, Mira complained. Jake grinned. His face was dark with mischief that Mira didn't care for. Babe, why'd you stop? Oh, Jake said, I thought maybe we'd park it here for a while and... He paused for his girlfriend to seize with terror, but it didn't deter him from finishing his proposal. Go for a little swim. A little swim? Jake, I can't even go in the five feet in the pool at the Y. Well, I can't exactly get you into the Y now, can I? Mira slumped with guilt. She hadn't paid a penny for a Y membership. Her co-workers had been teasing her about her weight. It bothered her, but she pushed through the pain because she didn't want to be pretty. But then she met this man, whom she was now clutching so tightly, and she wanted to look good again. And she, and she disclosed her self-image troubles. And he offered to convince his boss at the Y to let her come in. She remembered what she would always say to Jake. I've always wanted to learn to swim. I just can't do the deep end. I get scared. All the time he spent trying to gradually ease her into the five feet. His extraordinary patience. He was always determined to fulfill her dream. And now he was trying to, in spite of his bad luck at work, and this was how she was going to repay him? Over her dead body. Mira loosened her hold on her boyfriend. When he was fully released from her arms, he slipped out of his life jacket, hurling it into the sea. Within seconds, it was swallowed by the waves. Jake stood on the seat of the jet ski and in an instant jumped into the air and dove with a cry of delight. He made a great splash when his crown of red hair pierced the water's surface, causing Mira to wince when the water hit her face. Jake treaded the water with a bit of difficulty. Can I keep mine on? Mira asked when he swam up to her. A faint hint of disappointment passed over Jake's face. Of course, girl, he said. We'll get you swimming in no time, though. Mira looked like she was trying her best to disappear. She gazed into the ocean. It was no different than outer space in her mind. She often thought about how the watery deep and beyond the stars have virtually everything in common, though few people seem to realize it. Unending, mysterious, suffocating, full of unknown dangers and unfathomable events and beings. Mira dipped in a toe. Her eyes widened more from the flash of movement she perceived than the thought of the abyss below her. She looked up. Jake? Jake? Where was he? She scrutinized every inch of the ocean she could see, but her boyfriend was gone. As if demon-possessed, the jet ski began rocking. Mira grabbed for the handlebars, but quickly lost her balance and tumbled with a horrified shriek into the water. She bobbed like a fish lure, gasping for air. She heard Jake's laughter. Thought you needed a little encouragement, he cackled, appearing from behind the jet ski. Mira blinked rapidly, trying to expel the water from her eyes. She snorted, partly to clear her nose, partly out of rage. Why would you do that? Can't learn unless you take the plunge, baby girl. I'll show you, she snarled. She could barely see, but in her mind's eye, she could clearly discern the figures of so many people. Mr. Donald kicking her to the side when she entered the door, holding her down and belting out hyena laughter. 
Jake's mother peering at her with the sternest face whenever she and Jake held hands as if she were polluting her only son's beautiful milky skin, and her own mother standing before her and just shaking her head with profound disappointment, her eyes puffy and red, her face stained with tears, her maw hanging wide open in disbelief or as though she were trying to scream to no avail. Get back over here, you stupid, no good, evil bastard! Jake was stunned. Mira was trying to swim toward him, but was unsuccessful. She was slapping furiously. Her feet were stuck below her. Jake reached out his arm, but was blocked by the impossible. Some eldritch power from an especially trippy nightmare. A huge geyser gushed from the space between the two young lovers, ending any possibility of a quarrel. Jake felt himself knocked back by the massive waves it created. Mira, suddenly, and to her horror, was plunging into a merciless vortex filled with disorienting colors, brown oranges and deep blues and sickly greens. She felt herself drifting. She just managed to catch an image of something ferocious in her peripheral vision. A powerful force rushed dramatically past her ears and through her hair. She felt she was caught in some thick, slow wind and a large alien mama bird was sweeping around, the beak gnashing and picking playfully at her hair. Then she realized, for the first time in her life, she was totally submerged in water. M Mira then felt strong, muscly ropes coiling around her wrists and ankles. They hoisted her higher and higher until she no longer felt so numb and warm and was delivered out of the ocean's depths. It was vivifying, as if God had pulled her out of hell and up to heaven. She thought maybe she could hear the angels singing some welcoming song that the sirens probably taught them, because it was loud and whiny and it went like this. Mira, no, get away from that thing! Get away! Its intentions were ambiguous, and Mira didn't want to open her eyes as she began to understand that she hadn't drowned after all. The giant squid was holding her tighter than even she had held Jake on their magic carpet ride, which now seemed so far in the past. She felt herself being gently rocked back and forth, and the motion seemed to shake her brain into consciousness of what was happening. She slowly blinked, though enmeshed in a swarm of tentacles, her head was free. She lifted it and could see Jake bobbing in the distance, waving his arms frantically as if it would do any good. Jake! Jake, help! Something sharp nicked her from behind. She let out a little gasp of pain and twisted her head behind her shoulder to meet his eyes bobbing up and down like a golden ping pong ball. They had a glossy, beautiful shine, the eyes. The perfectly round pupils were deep and entrancing, looking at her with an unmistakable and enigmatic intelligence. They slowly shut and she felt the tentacles coiling up and down her limbs provocatively and she whimpered, trying half-heartedly to break free. She could feel something hard and smooth rubbing against her back. It was fluttering up and down like the blades of an excitable child's scissors. She yelled in agony and in terror, realizing in an instant that his beak was eating away her flesh. She saw blood rise to the surface in inky spirals and unpredictable spurts. Then, without warning, she lunged forward and choked, propelled by a strong and horrid pulse that had erupted below her. Everything turned black as the squid quickly reopened his eyes. So much ink there might have been an oil spill. The fluids of both bodies mixed together in an unnatural, taunting display, creating a tarry abomination. The squid raised a tentacle, one that had been idly hanging below the surface. 
It rose higher and higher, pointing towards the flattest point on the horizon. Jake had disappeared from Mira's sight for the second time, swallowed by the point where the sky touched the ocean. The jet ski, naturally, was being squeezed and crushed by various tentacles in boa constrictor fashion. Mira twitched the string of salt water in her gaping womb D didn't compare to the cold flurry of emotions that had gripped her body. The squid's spongy, conical head floated, calmly washing itself, preparing. His tentacles tightened as Mira thrashed and screamed more violently. The seagulls flew overhead, departing the beach, and Mira reached for them, desperately, practically squawking after them. The squid silently extinguished the beautiful glow from his eyes. The waves halted, the birds gave their last cries and disappeared into the clouds. All was still except for Mira, who fought even as the squid's head fell below the ocean. All that was left was a mass of animated limbs and the gushing of bubbles. He waited patiently as a spider waits on its prey, and when all was calm, he serenely let his arms trail behind the rest of him, casually slipping into the depths.